Thank you, John. It's always lovely to work with online events. You have a wonderful, welcoming community here, and I look forward to the next two hours. I will start sharing my slides straight away because I got loads of them for you. And um, I will have 10 minutes of breakout rooms only today. And I see there are many people who don't want to be in them. So we'll come together quite soon again. And at the end, there will be time for discussion, I hope. Um, and I hope it's a stimulating conversation where you will get inspired with new ways of thinking about things and new ways of using your practice or doing things. So um, I'm going to um, start on my slides straight away. And you should see them now. Yeah. They look great, Tammy. We can see them really Thank clearly. You Thank you very you. much. It is, as John said, all about building bridges. And we do that by looking at the conflicts that actually unite us. Like with a bridge, we stand on two sides of a divide and both of us want to be able to get across. So let's find ways of doing that. So this is me, I'm still the director of the New School, the Existential Academy and Dilemma Consultancy. And I am now president of the Existential Movement. NSPC, of course, runs five master's programs and two doctoral programs. The Existential Academy runs existential therapy training and various other things I won't be talking about. I'm really focusing now on the existential movement, which is a worldwide movement of mainly existential psychotherapists and philosophers who are coming together to use these ideas, psychotherapy, counseling, existential ideas, to bring wisdom to the world and not stay in our consulting rooms, but get in there with the politicians, with the bigger organizations in the wider world to hopefully improve how things work. These are my 20 books, which I won't belabor. This is the book that will come out early next year. I've just done on structural existential analysis, which is a research method. But this is the one I'm currently finishing for Penguin Books, which will be called probably The Art of Existential Freedom to come out sometime in 2025, Guide to a Wiser Life. So that is me getting out of the academic sphere into the public arena. So, today is dedicated to each and every one of you because I know that you are here because you have a deep interest in building bridges. And I would like to read to you L.R. Nost's little speech about that. Here's to the bridge builders. You, the hand holders, the light bringers, those extraordinary souls wrapped in ordinary lives, wrapped in ordinary lives, who quietly weave threads of humanity into an inhumane world. They are the unsung heroes in a world at war with itself. They are the whisperers of hope that peace is possible. Look for them in this present darkness. Light your candle with their flame. And then go. Build bridges. Hold hands. Bring light to a dark and desperate world. Be the hero you are looking for. Peace is possible. 
it begins with us. That's the motto for today's session. I am sure it will resonate with you as deeply as it does with me, because it is a great thing to know that we have such communities and that we can rely on each other to want to do the right thing. Nietzsche, in his untimely meditation, said, <clears throat> no one can build you the bridge on which you and only you must cross the river of life. There may be countless trails and bridges and demigods who would gladly carry you across, but only at the price of pawning and foregoing yourself. There is one path in the world that none can walk but you. Where does it lead? Don't ask. Walk. And this is also very important. It is about us building communities, but it is also about recognizing that we are not to be followers. We are to be each and every one of us willing to walk our path and to build a new bridge. Carl Jaspers, who is much underestimated philosopher, who I like greatly, always spoke about the importance of recognizing limit situations. He said, there are situations which remain essentially the same, even if their momentary aspect changes and their shattering force is obscured. The facts are, I must die, I must suffer, I must struggle, and I am subject to chance. And I also involve myself inexorably in guilt. So he called those fundamental situations our ultimate situations. For those of you who are not familiar with Jaspers, you will recognize this from Yalom's work, who got kind of inspired by, you know, ultimate situations. But Jasper said, in our day-to-day -day lives, we often evade them. We close our eyes and we live as if these things do not exist. We forget that we must die forget our guilt, forget that we are at the mercy of chance. The ultimate situations, death, chance, guilt, and uncertainty of the world confront me with the reality of failure. What do I do in the face of absolute failure, which, if I'm honest, I am failing to recognize? Now, I would like you to start making some notes on a piece of paper so that you're ready for when we go into the breakout rooms a little bit later and you're accumulating some ideas of your own here. So ask yourself, how have these limit situations reared their ugly head in your lives lately? And how are you able to confront them. So to remind you, the four limit situations that he recognized were struggle, Kampf in the German, and he said, we have to fight for our survival and we have to suffer. And we are in conflict with ourselves about this. We don't like it. Worse than that, we all know that we will die, death, tod. We all die eventually, and we try to forget it. Ernest Becker wrote a beautiful book about that and the denial of death. And again, Yalom, in his book on existential psychotherapy, 
really showed how important it is to get to the bottom of this with every one of your clients, because that denial of our death can be at the root of all of people's problems. But also we are subject to chance, to hazard, to fall. We live with uncertainty and don't know what our fate will bring. And, you know, existentialism is often looked at at the um, philosophy that believes that we are in complete control of our lives and we choose everything and we um, are in charge. But that is, just isn't true. When we really look at human existence, there are two sides to that question. On the one hand, we are inserted in a world that is already there when we come into it. And on the other hand, we are having to respond to what we find in the world and make something of it. So there is this tension all the time. And because we sometimes fail to do this, we feel a constant sense of guilt. I haven't been kind enough. I haven't understood well enough. I haven't worked hard enough. I haven't yet achieved what I wanted to achieve. I haven't really worked out my problems. These things are still troubling me. There must be something wrong with me. That kind of guilt can be really paralyzing. It is important to know that we share all these internal conflicts with these four big problems that can undermine us and that can also make us defensive with one another when we don't recognize that each of us, each of us is coming from those ang angles. Now, we can go into much more detail with that because the four that Jaspers recognized are actually can be opened up and we find many other things below it. I would also refer to Jean-Luc Nancy, who is a current contemporary French philosopher who in a book called The Fragile Skin talks about limit situations not as barriers, but as borders and boundaries. And that comes straight from Jaspers, who towards the end of his career had very much started to look at these limit situations as frontiers beyond which we discover something else. And in these liminal spaces, people also find the freedom to be transformed. So working with people in the liminal spaces is particularly productive. So there are all these frontiers in human existence. There is temporality, nothing lasts. There is gravity. We can't get away, thank goodness, from being stuck to this planet with our feet because of gravity. There's entropy. Anything you don't keep doing anything about will crumble away and disappear or rust or melt away or decay. That is how nature works. So only that which you maintain continues. And that is quite interesting because as you grow older, only the things that you keep remembering stay part of you. Only the skills that you keep going with remain part of you. Death, we've talked about that. Labor, you cannot survive unless you are willing to do the work of at least going, getting your shopping, you know, but in the old days, if you were a farmer, you wouldn't survive unless you were willing to put in the work on the land to till the, the field and to grow your crops. Illness, which inevitably will reach us, and we're already being warned again about the, another pandemic on the way. Failure, spoken about it. We cannot always be successful. Failure is an essential part of our lives because 
that this is how we learn by trial and error. Failure is built into the system. Loss, because of temporality, there will be losses in your life. So many layers of losses. And I hope you're making these notes of how all these things apply to you. Fragility, the realization of your vulnerability, your sensitivity, and indeed your fragility. Thank goodness, because that is also your ability to understand other people. Chance, indeed. Isn't it weird how things change in your life? Sometimes on a day when you were least expecting it, by a chance encounter or a phone call or an email or something changing in the world, which brings us to disaster and war and the encounter of this very terrible thing, hate in the world and conflict. All of these things are the things we need to dare to think about, talk about, and work with, especially if, like I've always done, you work with groups. In a group, it is essential to face up to the underlying negatives. Now, let's have a look at some of the resources we have in addressing all these things. And let's start with the conflicts between people, because that is what you will be working with. If you do any kind of couple therapy or you work with families or you work with groups or you teach in organizations where you work, where you uh, lead development groups or things like this. Daniel Dennett, who died earlier this year, who is not an existential philosopher, but who was a great philosopher, said that conflicts between people are part of our dialectical process of evolution. So you should always attempt when you are in conflict with somebody, and this is about discipline, this is about teaching yourself how to approach that. And it's not easy to do by any means. You should attempt to re-express, this is pure reformulation, pure Rogerian stuff, really, your target's position so clearly, vividly, and fairly that your target, well, the person you're in conflict with or in conversation with, says, thanks, I wish I'd thought of putting it that way. So you try to do complete total justice, putting yourself in their shoes as to what they're after, what they're saying and how they come across. And you say, this is what I learned from that. So you give them credit for what they have contributed. And you make those points very clearly. And then you look at where you agree and then you can add a word of critique, not criticism, I would say, and, well, rebuttal, disagreement, whatever. But the main thing is about building that bridge because you stand at opposite sides of the river or of the precipice and you need to come across. Never paralyze yourself by saying it's got to come from them first or they're aggressive or I'm not going to do it or it should be 50-50. Do what you can. And if you can only do 30%, so be it. But always aim for 70 or 80% of the work. So Daniel Dennett said that these ideas, these philosophical ideas are super important to the future of humanity because we need a new vision of what human beings are for with the demise of religion for 60 to 70 percent of the human population by now 
We need a new moral vision and we need a new vision of the meaning of life. And he proposed, this is a very sort of cynical view, I have a different view, but I think it's a good start, that the task of a human mind, each of our human minds, is to produce future. We are fundamentally anticipators. We are ex expectation generating um, organisms and we look for clues, we refine things, we solve problems, we save things from the past and we anticipate the future. And this is what we're good at and we can get better at doing that. So we create models by which we can act in more effective and rational ways. But this anticipation is a very important part of that process. Now, if you look at world politics, you will see that many politicians totally fail to understand this. They still see human relations as a massive competition and a conflict where one person wins and the others lose. But it isn't like that. So let's look at the theory of Martinoga and Silenzak which is very interesting, which has these different forms of conflict you can recognize. So there are data conflicts, interest conflicts, structural conflicts, relationship conflicts, and value conflicts. So very briefly, but again, ask yourself, you know, what kind of conflicts have you learned to avoid? What kind of conflicts do you get trapped into? So data conflicts are caused by lack of information or misinformation. So that people end up with different views and believe they've got the facts, but they probably haven't. <clears throat> Interest conflicts are caused by competitive um needs and interests. So it is about people perceiving themselves as in competition over scarce resources. Structural conflicts are come out of basically inequality between people and geographic or em environmental or time constraints, structural things that are hard to change. Relationship conflicts come from misperceptions, stereotype, poor communication, miscommunication, negative behavior, strong emotions. These are the ones we are most familiar with and we forget all these other ones. And value conflicts, which is one I'm particularly interested in, come from people evaluating ideas and situations in different ways by their own standards and their different ideologies or their different world views. So we got a load of problems that we have to learn to recognize and then we have to learn to deal with. I hope you've made a note of the five kinds so that you can, when you go into your breakout room, use that as a model. Now, these are wonderful models to also keep in mind. So this is the conflict spiral of Claire Graves, who died in 1986, but I know of no better model. So she recognized that conflicts tend to spiral and they spiral always in the same way, following the same path. So it starts people doing something together, they're cooperating, but then it turns into some kind of competition. They begin to look at each other askance and they think the other one is not up to 
collaborative things. The other one is undermining them. So it becomes a competition. Inwardly, each of the competing people in this so-called collaboration, let's say it's a couple, starts to assume that the other one is deliberately undermining them or is attacking them or is having bad thoughts about them. So each partner becomes defensive. No, you can't do this to me. I'm going to keep you at arm's length. And each of the partners is going to look for support elsewhere. Now, as soon as you look for support, it assumes that you're lining up on one side and there is another party on the other side. Now, this is a very good thing to do if you're getting bullied or indeed, you know, there are some people who are after you and are treating you badly, then really you do need to find those alliances and seek that support. But if you're still in a process of collaboration, the moment you do that is the moment you start really spiraling further. Because now the support groups will start attributing motives to the opposite group and rely on assumptions rather than on facts. And the group thinking makes it so that you start to believe you're absolutely in the right and the others are completely in the wrong. And so instead of building a bridge, what you're doing is that you're destroying the connections and you're removing yourself from proximity to the people or the person that you were cooperating with. And beliefs feed observations. So you will start finding evidence for your suspicions and you become moralistic about it and start saying, they're bad, I'm good, they're bad, I'm in the right, they're in the wrong. And then it becomes personalized and there are attacks flying forwards and backwards and you actually begin to try to hurt the other before you are getting hurt. And now you've got a war and that always ends in the same place, friends. Mutual self-destruction. There is no other way, unless you find a way to de-escalate. Now, here is a model also based on Graves' work, but going in the other direction, where you get a sense of the way in which the, um, oh, hang on, it's going backwards for some reason, all by itself. There we go. The human evolution is actually towards more understanding and more awareness, but it starts with these archaic, instinctive, survival instincts where we are willing to fight with each other and destroy each other even though it leads to mutual destruction rather than just to destruction of the enemy. After that societies begin to go towards a magic animalistic tribal search for security you know looking for ways to magically think you are better than the others and defending yourself then Populations create gods of power that are on their side and that can protect them and they can sacrifice to and do things to be safe. So it becomes an egro, egro, egocentric, impulsive kind of power and dominance based way of organizing your world. From there on, you create hierarchical worlds where it is clear who are at the top and who are at the bottom. And those who are at the top are godlike and hold the power and those who are at the bottom become suppressed. So 
the power of understanding and of exercising your freedom becomes distributed in a hierarchical way. Then societies move to a stage where they do scientific research, start thinking about strategy, start thinking about progress, start thinking about how achievement happens, and they begin to form a more rational picture of how people can work together. Out of that, people create theories of equality and harmony and community, which is what I think we see a lot in our counseling and therapeutic communities, where we want to be sensitive to each other and establish communities of equality, where we all work together and create harmony. To actually make that an integrative thing, where there is proper synergy, where we really put our energies together is a whole other effort, really, to bring that out into the world and to bring that light into places where there isn't that light. That is a whole other task. And ultimately, idealistically, that leads to being in a place of holistic awareness where you make room for all different perspectives and you really hold that place where all of that is visible and comes together. Now, if you look back to the, to the, the well, really the 15th century um, and this painting by Hieronymus Bosch, one of my uh, favorite painters, when he painted this very kind of Catholic image of the seven deadly sins and the four last things, this was all about going along with a morality that tried to teach people um, that it wasn't just about obeying God or doing what the Bible tells you, that you also had to do this inner work on your own emotions and your own negative tendency. Because if you didn't, then you weren't just in conflict with yourself, you were in conflict with the world out there, and you were also in conflict with God's law. And after your death, there would be a final judgment on you as to whether you had managed to do this. Now, these, these um, seven deadly sins, of course, I'm sure you know them, are wrath, which is basically anger or revenge, envy, greed, gluttony, sloth, lust, and pride. I find them quite interesting because they are a bit like limit situations. You know, these are things we all fear and we a lot of our clients actually battle with these things but we've gone beyond this a bit here is nicholas bergiev's view about it early 20th century russian writer a book called the destiny of man very interesting who said you'll see rollo may was very inspired by this stuff there is a the monocle element in man, for there is in him the fathomless abyss of freedom. And as I'm writing this book about freedom, this, this has become very alive to me. Yes, it's true. It is because we have this inner freedom that we also get tempted into filling that freedom with things that are attractive or negative or that are thrown at us by society. And so many people have their minds filled with so many negative images from social media, from games, from Netflix, uh, aggressive, violent programs. It is astonishing to me what people put into their minds and also what people still put into their bodies in terms of you know, all sorts of substances, including coffee and sugar and all sorts. So there is an importance to 
be willing to look at how we're actually living our lives and how we're actually dealing with those internal states and that internal conflict in order to become more fully alive, more able to see how these oppositions happen and to go beyond it. And as you very well know, all of you, there is a huge need for people who are willing to do this and to think this clearly about what is going wrong in the world. This is striking. In the Psychiatric Times earlier this year, which is an American publication, it said this was a year of record high suicide rates in the United States. For the first time, the numbers have hit the same level as in 1941. So remember in 1941, the USA joined the Second World War and people were called up, soldiers were called up and there were many people who killed themselves because they did not want to go into the draft. So we're at that same level again. And globally, there is an estimated 5% of adults who suffer from depression, which is depression as diagnosed by a doctor. But we all know from our practice that that is a much higher figure and that so, so many ordinary people who haven't got a diagnosis are going around their everyday life feeling depressed. WHO says that one in every eight people on this planet live with a mental disorder. I refuse to call it a mental disorder. If it becomes this much, these are not mental disorders, people. People are miserable and unhappy and they have lost track of how to live their lives in a way that gives them fulfillment and satisfaction. I'm not even talking about happiness. So the facts about anxiety are stunning as well. There's an estimated 40 million Americans who are affected by anxiety, i.e. 19% and asking for tablets for it. There are over 8 million people in the UK, figures from Mental Health UK, 12% of the European population at any time is suffering from anxiety. The Mental Health Foundation estimates that 40% of people in 2022, the year of the pandemic or one of the years of the pandemic, had medium or high anxiety. So we know, and this is truly shocking to me, that antidepressant prescriptions are going up year on year and they have tripled over the past two decades from 18.4 18 million in 1998 to 70.9 million in 2018 in the UK alone. And the figures for, you know, current use are much, much higher than that again. So in 2021, the figures were astonishingly high. The nice figures are that the cost of anxiety in the EU is 41 billion euros by now, probably a lot more. Also, there are 60,000 deaths by suicide in the EU alone. What on earth is going on? We need to open our eyes to this. This is very serious. And this is what is being done about it. I'm very skeptical. So there's lots of research about major depressive disorders, which often includes looking at anxiety as well. But really, all these hypotheses, you know, the monoamine hypothesis, the inflammatory hypothesis, the genetic one, 
they're all just by the by. You see, there is a tiny little portion there for social psychological hypotheses. And there people are only looking at how stress and traumatic events influence people's state of mind. But we're talking about something much bigger than that here. We're talking about how people are not just becoming anxious and depressed in stressful or traumatic times, People feel like this every day of their lives because they have lost a sense of purpose and they have lost a sense of who they are and what it is for and how they can live a life that gives them meaning and feels worth worthwhile. Now, Joanna Moncrief has done some amazing research to go against this trend and to prove that depressive disorders are not medical conditions and that the serotonin theory of depression, for instance, is manifestly wrong. It is not a mental illness. It is a state of mind which then has an impact at all levels in your body and in your brain. But it is a state of mind, not the other way around. And so we need to dare think what is happening with people's state of mind. Well, I have a few hypotheses about that. So we're all aware that things are going to pot. And that is really quite a lot of pressure to be dealing with in the background all the time. So the UN Environment Programme warns us that the planet's, planet is declining, not just in terms of climate crisis, but in lots of other ways too. So we are using the equivalent of 1.6 Earth to maintain our current way of life and our ecosystem cannot keep up with it. One million of the world's eight million species of plants and animals are threatened with extin extinction and 75% of the earth land surface has been altered by human action. 66% of the ocean, ditto. 90% of the marine fish stocks are fully exploited or depleted. Our global food system is under threat. So there are some serious problems facing the whole of humanity. And in the middle of all that, we have seen wars spiraling. Since the beginning of the new millennium, there have been many more violent conflicts again in our lives. When I visited NATO in the 90s, as I was uh, saying to John before we started, and I was asked to, to talk about how psychotherapy might help diplomacy in the world, um, they were very interested in it because at that time there were no violent conflicts they were worried about. And there was an overall optimism about where, you know, the East and the West were coming together. And so they were open to this conversation. Now, after basically 2001, when we had 9-11, the world built back into violent conflicts. And the way it's going at the moment is frightening to each and every one of us, not just to the people caught in the middle of it. I just saw an amazing piece of research that's been done about Ukrainian refugees, a comparison of the state of mind of the Ukrainian refugees, all six million of them, as opposed to Ukrainians who stayed in their own country facing the conflict. 
And it's actually the ones who move to a different country who have suffered the most because their anxiety about what's happening there and their loss of connectivity with their peers and their families has been very, very hard to absorb. So what are we doing and how can we prevent and resolve such conflicts? We need to feel that we understand how these threats happen and we need to take seriously how this troubles all of us. So we need to start thinking about how we create connectivity and collaborate instead of competing and threatening each other. And this is the moment where I would like you to go into your breakout rooms and think about your own experiences with these different forms of conflict and how you have found a way through what you have discovered about the importance of that bridge building in your own life. And I will just ask one or two or three of you to feed back. We won't have time for all the groups to feed back. So think at the end of your group, you'll have 10 minutes and think at the end of your conversation if one of you has something really important to contribute to this session and will come to the wider group to report on that. That would be wonderful. Over to John and his team to organize the groups. Thank you. You're in 10. Yes. Could you just give us the question again, like just to re-encapsulate it's, it's sometimes helpful how, just to hear it one more time. How have you in your own life been able to deal with significant conflict of any of those types really and found a way to build a bridge against the odds. That Thank is you. precious information for us to harvest from this group. Yes. Thank you, Amy. That feels really clear and such an important task. So, Jeff, I think we're coming to you. You've been kind of creating the groups. So we'll have some of us who'll be working in um, those small groups and some of us will stay with Jeff in a quiet space with the opportunity maybe to make notes around that question too, to feedback together. When we come back, we can also use the chat, which could be a great way to collate those responses as well. So. Great. Okay, Jeff, over to you for 10 minutes on the clock. We're all coming back together. Good to see you if you were here with Jeff in the quiet space. Welcome back if you've been in the small groups. And Emmy, I think we've got you on mute, so let's make sure we can... Hello, everybody. I hope you had some interesting conversations. And I hope we um, we have a couple or three of you who will volunteer to feed back something that happened in your group and that we would all like to hear about. So hands up, you can either put your hand up or use the hands up tool. And I hope that people will help me in seeing who is having... I'm watching to see if anybody's waving at us or... I and if anybody know. want also wants to type away in the chat, you're really welcome to oh, yeah. so that we That's don't miss also anything. That's a very good so thing can... to do. Yeah. Oh, Jazz, I can see you waving. Let's see if we can open. Okay, it. let's hear right. you. Great. Hello. Hello. Um, Hi. I hope you're well. So basically, uh, just from our group, first we felt we're we a lot of us don't really like conflict and um yep so of our character and nature we tend to not really have that many conflicts yep. but uh where there have been conflicts say for example it might be with a client um we've learned to be re reflective and to step back and to listen to what's going on in that space fantastic Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Now, there are two really interesting things about that. 
first of all, you, you're remarking, as we probably all know this, yeah. that anyone who goes into the counseling or therapy field tends to have more than normal sensitivity and vulnerability yeah. and dislikes conflict. Yes. That is just true across the board. There's research done on that too. So dealing with conflict then becomes specifically important because we tend to avoid it. And sometimes we get into the danger of even denying it when it's there. Yeah. So your other words were also very important, which is that we all need to have a go-to way of dealing with it. And that is very much that first step, isn't it? Yes. Which is to stop, pause, not engage with it, give yourself time to ponder, yeah. and then look at what is going on in the space between the two or three or four people rather than take a side. So it's like you rise above it. You take what I like to call a bird's eye view of the situation mm -hmm. and you get this much clearer sense of the dynamic in the room. And then when you comment on that dynamic, and you pay attention and listen to what is happening for each of the people in that conflict, you get a much better chance of having a productive outcome to the conflict, not just to solve the conflict, but to actually get to the bottom of what it is about. And there's often a lot of good stuff in there. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Fantastic. It sounds like you had a very productive group. We did. There. We, did. We, yeah. didn't, we didn't think we would, but once we started talking, we realized um, as therapists or being empathic, we had a lot in common. Yeah. And the way we dealt with things were very. We do. So, we do. Yeah. We've all been on the same path, you know, yes. by definition. Yeah. And we all need to allow ourselves to to make more of what we know yes, and to draw it out of our experience. We know so much and we're not always using it or formulating it, articulating it. Yeah. So well done. Thank you very much for bringing that back to the group. Uh, I see there's several others. Now I have no idea how I'm going to... Ah, thank you. <laughs> Somebody else is doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about the limit situations and about the mm. relationship between struggle and guilt. Yeah. For myself, being from marginalized groups and coming from the care system and and sort of becoming safe and having a lot of things now at my disposal, the guilt that comes with that. Yeah. I think that in order to build a bridge between those two things, I think representation um, or, you know, breaking down that word representation, you know, being a bridge between two worlds, you know, and. Yeah. Oh, this is very interesting. We'll stop there for a moment. That, that's fantastic. Now you make me think about Simon and Garfunkel, you know, like a, like a bridge over troubled water. I shall lay me down. <laughs> it's like you are saying you are willing to recognize that you have had to do this very hard work of finding a bridge over what felt like a precipice in the past mm -hmm. and you have safely landed on another side yeah and now you realize that you can either stand on that other side and pull up the bridge as it were like the ladder yeah. and leave the others there and that's terrible that's guilt 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 or you can enable the others to improve that bridge or to use that bridge or to come across where you are to safe land and if you don't do that it feels terrible mm, yeah and to have one foot 
or, or, or you know to, to be that bridge is to is to is to always to some extent be the outsider because you're yeah. never really in one place yeah but yeah that, but that can you know be so I resonate with this so very very deeply I have felt like that my whole life you know being a a child of people surviving the second world war and 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 always feeling that guilt of you know where i gotten myself to and where i came from and what i owe to the world to pay that back and how much that can sometimes exhaust you yeah but also how precious it is to know that and to stay with it and to honor it as well. It's mm -hmm. both those things, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank That's you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. That that was personally very revealing for me. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take one more. You decide who. <laughs> Rachel, I think you were next. In the... Yes, there we are. Thank you. Hi, Rachel. I'm yeah, unmuted. I think lovely to see you. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, morning. I, I, it was really interesting to consider the bird's eye view from what Elle said, um, being in the therapy room. But our group was discussing something around, um, and I, I, I don't mind saying that in my personal life, and I'm spotting it a little bit more or raising awareness of it in the therapy room where I am far more likely to cross the bridge and be the other side. And that kind of reticence to get someone to come over and get my side. Oh, that's also and, very interesting. That's an angle I hadn't just thought about well, at all. <laughs> but, yeah, and it's so sure, saying it's that there is, because that. that's not just you, is it? That's what we do as therapists. It's like, we make that effort, that's what we learn to do, to make the effort to go across that bridge and to be with the other. But actually, they have to learn to make the effort and go across their own bridge, not just the bridge we're holding out to them, but they need to learn that they are strong enough to be a bridge builder themselves. And when you build your own bridge, the wonder of that is that it's up to you to decide when you use it and when you retreat to your own safe space again, isn't it? So there is also something there about going back and forth on a bridge. Sometimes meeting in the middle, and I what really resonated with me around that, and you said being with, yes. but I think you've got to consider the being for as well, yes. Yes, because sometimes right. it's like you're, you don't meet in the middle, and that actually, in my own kind of personal life, I've just wondered where we're meeting, and is it in the middle? It's um, very or rarely I, exactly in the middle. <laughs> It's very, very rarely in the middle, isn't it? In a relationship, there are like two bridges. And sometimes you use the one and you meet three quarters of the way or you go all the way to the other side. And sometimes you use the other and you only go this far or that far. It is a whole negotiation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And this is the, the mystery of human relationships that, that we have yet to discover so much more about and how all that is relevant to people who are in dire straits and who sometimes need to borrow bridges. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, we need to build a bridge for a whole bunch of people who are lost somewhere yeah. on the other side of the precipice. So thank you very much for that too. Now I will go back to my talk. Um, although I see that Cora had raised her hand and I hope very much, Cora, that you hold on to that and you come back to it when I finish with the slide. So I'll go back to sharing my presentation. I can and see I coming up on the screen and I can also see the comments in the chat. So please, anybody who wants to 
put any more comments in there, please feel free to. And I'll make sure you see them at the end, Amy, as well. So, yeah. Thank you, John. So here we are. We are looking for a way to understand conflict from that bird's eye view and have a philosophical understanding it and approach these problems in more creative, dynamic and reflective ways and to dare engage with that in a personal way instead of hiding behind our own safety. It's about each of us daring to speak up about this, to have more moral courage to affirm what we know is possible and what is needed in the world. And all three of you did that beautifully. So thank you so much for that. Now, why is that important? Well, it is important because as Robert Waldinger said, loneliness kills more than anything else in the world. And we're living in a world where people have become terribly disconnected. And so his hypothesis is that it is that loneliness that may be behind all of these so-called mental health problems and that what people need is greater connectivity, more bridge building. And he did not come up with that very simple summary out of nowhere. He, um, and could do go watch his TED talk there. It's absolutely worth seeing because that comes out of a Harvard study of over 80 years where they took two groups. One were sophomores at Harvard University and the other group was extracted from boys in a Boston's poorest neighborhoods. Um, and they were kind of like opposite groups. They done tests with them all the time, huge project. They scrutinized their health and their mental health. And they did so over decades. They did so not just with the people who were original, but with their children and with their grandchildren too. And so they created a whole database of how this actually works. And what they discovered is that people need to build networks that are meaningful, not just any old networks, networks that are meaningful to them in which they can trust other people to really talk about what matters in meaningful relationships. And when they do that, they have better health and better mental health and they have much greater life expectancy. So they concluded that loneliness kills and yet one in five Americans feels lonely. They also found that when people live with constant irresolvable conflicts, they cut themselves off. They avoid the networks and the togetherness. But a good life is built from good relationships and love ha, is the missing bridge of well-being. Where have we heard that before? Do you know, all world religions talk about that. All world religions have one and the same belief, absolutely shared, but expressed differently, which is don't do to another what you don't want them to do to you. Treat another as you want to be treated yourself and love each other. Every world religion preaches that. And now we discover that this is indeed the key to overcoming bad mental health. But it isn't easy to get to that place because being human is hard work. You have to learn to survive 
and that takes up a lot of your life quite frankly being a child and a teenager is all about just learning the skills to look after yourself to be a unit to make your organism survive and to hold your own in the world where there is a lot of hostility a lot of the time and, you know, once you're in your 20s and you get on with procreation and looking after a family and earning your keep, you're still just doing the survival rounds. And you may never even have taken the time to properly welcome yourself into the world, let alone to find a way to find others who you feel actually welcome you into the world. And that is what love is. To feel absolutely welcome with the other. And that starts with respect and love of yourself. And you know, how many clients do you have who come to you on session one with real respect and love for themselves. Never. This is always defective. It always has to be rediscovered and rebuilt. Now ask yourself how many politicians out there who are waging wars have respect and love for themselves in that deep way? Hmm. You have to find space and time to learn to reflect and build your inner integrity, which means to sieve all your life events through the filter of what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what isn't so good, what is true and what isn't true. This is hard work. It takes many decades to get good at that. And then you have to learn to thrive despite all the conflicts you will encounter and all the challenges you have to deal with. And this is about building not just your inner integrity, but also your outer resilience and your capacity to keep transforming and taking the challenging challenges into your stride, learning all the time. And as you do so, new possibilities emerge. It is like you go to different levels of life as you master these things. And you become aware that when you speak about yourself, that is a completely different thing at one point in your life than at another. And that the couple you create with the person you love is a completely different thing depending on how you live together and how you work it out together. And that a society is a completely different thing according to how we organize it and how we pay attention to all the different needs and how we solve the conflicts. All these things, the self, the couple, the community, the society, the state, they are not things that are set and can be defined once and for all. They are alive like organisms. They are a matrix, yes, a matrix for meanings and values to become manifested dynamically. And they constantly change according to how we learn to open and close our filters, build the bridges, allow the meanings to unfold, we are constantly constructing and weaving those meanings together. And freedom and evolution and meaning are emergent properties of being and only come out of doing us, us doing that work. So it is about learning to be in dialogue, not just in dialogue with the people close to you, but with everybody, not just with people, but also with the things in this world. 
with your life, with yourself, with ideas. It is about daring to put things in question and learn to listen to life again, to listen to life through the words of other people and have these constructive dialogues like we do in therapy beyond blame and shame. Some of us call it social phenomenology, Socratic dialogue, mediation, experiential democratic dialogue in Kirk Schneider's case. It's about not labeling each other, but together seeing the structures, the movements, the needs, the difficulties, the conflicts, and figuring it out. It is ontodynamics in process. We need to make maps of the connections and the values and always take into account the negatives as well as the po positives, the paradoxes and the tensions, the shadows and the dialectics. And so we need to evolve in the way we dialogue. When people are in conflict, we are at number one, so we start from bottom up there. When they're hostile with each other, I find this a lot when I work with couples, you know, people come with hostility to each other rather than love. The love has disappeared, the hostility is foregrounded, and they very quickly end up calling each other names. And the first thing they learn is to argue for their own view, which is to explain their own view, but they're still arguing to try and prove their view is better than the other. Then you teach them to have a debate about the differences. Oh, so this is how you look at it, and this is how I am different but there is still some hostility there, although there is now a, a recognition of difference and of the precipice between. And when you start to get into actual dialoguing about essentials and also about similarities and even things that are always true in couples or in human beings, you see the bridge gradually being built and eventually we come to this dialectical collaboration where we do not try to find compromises, but we try to make room for what everybody needs and there is time for all concerned and we listen to all concerned. Now, I'm not going to talk about this, but we also obey the Ten Commandments of Logic. This is my philosophical background coming. No ad hominem attacks, no straw man fallacies, no hasty generalizations, no begging the questions. These are crucial when you run groups. These are very important rules for intervening as a facilitator when you see these things happening. But I'm not going to focus on them, but that's too much detail. There are, though, different listening levels of engagement as people learn to listen to each other. So it starts by them talking about their experience, expressing their feelings. And aren't we all good at that as counselors and therapists? Yeah, but what do you feel? You know, what is behind that? What is really the emotion? I feel anger. But then we take it a level higher. So what is the anger about? What is the value that is being threatened right now? Now speak about what it is that makes you feel threatened and how you are threatened and what about that is threatening and what exactly is threatening and is it actually being threatened? We go around the houses and we check the facts and then we get to the level of understanding where there is a kind of more contemplative mood. 
what really is our situation here? What does each of us think? And how do we situate ourselves? What are our limitations? What is our struggle? We go back to what we were saying earlier. What is the actual reality of our competitiveness here? And what is the actual reality of our cooperation here? What is this alternative way in which we can come together and have possibilities for the future? What is my capacity? What is your capacity? And how together can we transform in a dialectical way and shift a level towards problem solving and learning and acting together in a constructive way instead of staying in our reactive experiencing of emotions? That is what you need when you intervene in large group or large organizations in conflict. It's all about connectivity. Human beings find meaning by putting the pieces together and reaching the gap and having that wonderful feeling about connecting. We feel best when we weave things together. You know, that's where the word religion comes from. It's the Latin word religare, linking things together, or actually re-linking things together that have been pulled apart. So as people, we try to do that, but we end up sort of only controlling a little bit of territory. And, our, and holding on to our safe connections. And when those are lost or under threat, we feel suddenly a sense of panic and disconnection because our framework of meaning is severed. And then it gets dangerous. And you know, this is happening in the brain as you are feeling it too. But it doesn't first happen in the brain and then make you feel that. No, this is how the brain processes stuff. So in the brain, it is also all about connectivity, adaptability and flexibility. Your neurons are constantly making new synaptic connections. You've got 85 billion neurons and 84 billion other cells in that brain. And they're always rewiring constantly. Oh, think of the rewiring you're doing as you're listening to all of this. You're working really hard and your brain is taking on all these new connections. And of course, they're click, click, clicking away because you already have a lot of this knowledge there, but you're connecting it up in a stronger new way as we speak. And when that happens a lot, you will actually make neurons in your hippocampus, which is where your brain stores information, well, short-term information. And so we learn and adapt and we evolve as we make more connections, build more bridges, and also as we disconnect. Now, remember this. Adaptability is the main thing we need to learn. Flexibility and neuroplasticity are the future. Let your dendrites grow and remember that they only connect once you sleep. Sleep is when all of the new information of the day gets stored into your long-term memory. And if you don't sleep enough, you will just lose it, what you've learned. And remember that, yes, as we grow older, we are pruning some of those connections and losing neurons. But I have decided and come to the conclusion that if you live your life right by learning carefully all your life, by the time you get old, as I am, you are pruning away the stuff that is superfluous 
I can't remember people's names anymore, you know, authors of things or dates of things. But that's because I haven't made the effort to remember those things because they don't matter. It's not about the people or the dates. It's about what we learn together. And that, if you have, you know, fostered your brain, will become ever clearer as you grow older. So, remember to sleep. Always prioritize your sleep. New learning is always about undoing bad connections and rewiring. It's about updating yourself <clears throat> and recreating yourself. And if there's some bad stuff in your network, and or the links are broken, it feels hollow. It feels like empty space inside of you. It literally can feel as if all your connections are suddenly gone and you may feel lost, confused, upset, bereft, angry, and ill at home. The reactive response then is to fight or flee. This is a very poignant picture of a group of friends enjoying life right at the beginning of 9-11 when they had no idea what was happening right behind them there. Well, literally the world was changing. So the reactive response is to fight and flee, but learn to go slow when you feel that and take time to pause and ponder. Always take time to pause and ponder. You have to find a clear place above the destruction to rebuild and to see where new bridges, new neural connections are needed. New collaboration is needed. New community building is required. And when your bridges are destroyed, build new ones. Do the hard work to bridge the breach space always. And that is hard work because it takes a lot to build a bridge you can actually trust. It's never done in a day. It always takes quite a while. Be patient. And remember, it's not just bridges, it's actually an organic thing. It's much more like the repairing of net networks like rhizomes and biospheres. And as you know, forest mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of fungi that grow underground and have mutually beneficial relationship with tree roots. So the underground work is as important as the overground work is too. Gain perspective, get an overview, reclaim your right to connectivity and see where connections are possible. Face the conflict together. Nietzsche said, Man is a rope tied between beast and overman, a rope over an abyss. What is great in man is that he is a bridge and not an end. So for Nietzsche, the meaning of life is that we have to do this work, that each of us is a little unit of consciousness that is building connections and building new meanings, frameworks, networks, bridges. We are creating something that we are a part of and we do not quite know what, but we know, like Dennett said, that we are absolutely capable of doing that and each of us has a role to play in that. R.D. Lang spoke about psychotherapy in that way and said that psychotherapy is an attempt of two people to recover the wholeness of being human. It isn't just about that person. It's like you're doing the work of a lifetime with each of your clients to bring into the room that sense of the wholeness of being human. 
and be honest. You're doing it as much for yourself as you're doing it for each of your clients. With each of your clients, you put a little piece of the puzzle into your own understanding of how everything works. It is a process of searching and researching what we all feel we have lost. And I think that is a sacred work. And I think it's much underestimated. And when we take it seriously and we build strong bridges between us, they will stand the test of time. I had this picture in this presentation because I gave this presentation once before in Istanbul at a European conference. And I was very impressed with this bridge in Turkey, which was built over a thousand years ago. And you can see how magnificent it still looks. Now, here is an application. I was very, very um, pleased to be on the outskirts of the Northern Ireland peace process in 1998. So we had 30 years of troubles, violent conflicts, and many attempted ceasefires. Tony Blair, to his credit, in spite of everything else, and Bertie Ahern agreed to tackle it. But they had the wisdom of knowing they couldn't do it. Absolutely key. So the talks were chaired by George Mitchell a special envoy, a diplomat from the USA. And what they ended up with was a multi-party agreement. So this was a large group process. It was a large group of people, not just eight in that room. There were many people in that room at different times. And they reached an international agreement, which is still outstanding in the world. And the key to it was what George did. George Mitchell knew that he needed to allow both views, well, actually all views, to be acknowledged as legitimate. And that future sovereignty had to be left open. So it was about bridge building and accepting different views in the room. George Mitchell in 2023 interviewed about it said, and I love this, <clears throat> I listened to the same people saying the same things over and over again. Many of them talked very fast, some in accents I wasn't familiar with. To improve my understanding, I held many many informal meetings in my office and theirs where I said little and listened as much as possible. Here's the key. Listening. Really listening to someone else is hard, especially when it goes on for years. But it's also a sign of respect. And I respected them for what they were trying to do. Now, where did he get his support? I'll tell you, not many people know this. John Alderdice, who is now, for his efforts, Lord John Alderdice, but who was then our colleague at the Centre for the Study of Conflict and Reconciliation at the University of Sheffield, which my husband Digby, Tantum and myself created and managed. And he was part of the Northern Ireland peace talks as a psychotherapist. And he was working with George Mitchell. And he was insisting that until every party had been heard into the depth, no negotiation should happen. So it was a very slow process. And that is how it worked. 
It wasn't a diplomatic process to try and cobble together quick solutions. No, it was to get to the bottom of what was actually going on and knowing that everybody was in the same boat. They were not enemies. They were human beings, all of whom were in the impossible situation of representing a constituency that would feel they had done them down. They were the fools that were going to have to go back to sell the final solution to their constituency. And so they were all the same. They were all willing to make it work and they were all going to suffer. They were jointly responsible for creating something new, a creative future rather than a destructive future. And all these things were explained to them, how that works, how we create a joint task, a common purpose, how we move forward with cooperation, peaceful methods, establish that everyone feels heard all the time. Nobody gets ganged up on or ridiculed. We are patient with each other. We are persistent. We get to the bottom of what is behind conflict. We overcome lack of trust. We restore it again and again. We create hope and opportunity. We remember that we want the same thing, this creative future than this destructive future. Everyone just wants peace, a good life, a good job, a safe place to live. No one will win unless we win together. This is true in Northern Ireland. It is true everywhere else. This is the Derry London Derry Peace Bridge, a striking architectural marvel that connects communities previously divided by the River Foyle, a symbol of this determination to bring it together and not allow us to destroy each other. And this is what we need in Ukraine and in Israel as well, because it is possible to do it. But you know, people don't believe it. They see that all over the world, exploitation wins over fairness. Profit and productivity win the day over creativity. It's all about consumption instead of generosity, achievements over long-term viability, short-term results, not thinking about the consequences, people wanting freedoms without being prepared to take the responsibilities, people wanting rights rather than obligations and duties, people wanting to compete and win rather than collaborate, instant gain rather than eternal values, fame and fortune rather than right living in a community. Excite and youthful experimentation over mature reflection and understanding, inequality and oppression over fairness and justice. This is what we're up against. A mentality overall in the world where the wrong principles always win the day. And we have become used to evil to violence and destruction, because that is what evil is. Evil is the opposite of live. Actually, the word is the other way around. Evil. Turn it around and you get live. Hannah Arendt, looking at what had happened in the Holocaust, said what happened was that very slowly... 
the unthinkable ways of dealing with other human beings was normalized. That evil was soaked into society and that's why people could get away with it. Why are we sitting and doing nothing when people are bombing kids day after day? Because we have become tired, we have compassion fatigue. It's the banality of evil. It has become a daily occurrence. We are used to it. You know, we can build those bridges and create a planet where there is a global human well-being. There are simple things we can do. I shan't belabor it, but we know how to do that but the will is not there. So we need to change that vision first before we try to establish that. We need to understand how human beings work and how they can work together, looking after all aspects of their, um, their life and being able to do all of those things and to become resilient in that process. And it starts with each individual. Each and every one of you as counselors and therapists are doing this work. You are truly like people who know what is needed, but you're doing it so almost in secret, you know, in hiding. And the wider world does not know about this. I realize I need to rush because we're coming to the end. So I'm skipping a lot of very good uh, slides that I would have loved to talk about. So you know what Frankel said. He quoted Nietzsche who said, he who has a why for can bear almost any how. And this is how people survived in the concentration camps, because they had a purpose. Now, people have lost this sense of purpose. And if they don't have a sense of what their life is for, they will just try to look after themselves and they will disconnect from a world that feels bad. So they become maybe self-possessed and maybe actually they become dispossessed and they lose their courage. They forget that courage is to keep going even when life is difficult. So we need to reconnect between each of our lives and see how this connects us up to the wider world, and I'm really looking into this now, seeing how world religions have so much in common. I'm very interested in panpsychism. Philip Goff's book, Why the Purpose of the Universe, is a very good start on that. It's all about growing when we have challenges, you know, pearls growing, stones being worn down, edges smoothed out, the roots doing the work, even in winter, learning to love your life is learning to love your challenges and know that every challenge teaches you more, makes you more connected, more understanding to how it all fits together. Remember what I said earlier, love is the bridge of life. There's no doubt about it. Love for life love for yourself in all your manifestations, love for what is possible, love for each other, love for humanity, love for life, love for the universe, you name it. We tune into it. We learn to dedicate ourselves to it. We sharpen our tools. We learn to be alive and work in that way and that engagement is what brings hope because hope is not a passive thing but an active thing we live deliberately and so we come to a way of living that is about 
comprehension, understanding each other, working together, collaborating with reflexivity, building value and meaning, seeking truth, which is what gradually comes together as we build the network and meanings form a picture and we get some perspective on what we're actually doing here on this planet. And it starts with individuals, but together creating a better world. As Mandela said in 94, we might have our differences, but we are one people across the world with a common destiny in our rich variety of culture, race, and tradition. And we're intertwined with the cosmic order. There is no doubt about it. As Bohm, you know, the physicist called it the implicate order of the universe, which we see manifested here in our own lives. So as therapists and counselors, you are the guardians of this art of living that we are figuring out and to which we're adding new understanding all the time by sharing what we learn in that process and by allowing the light to reach in these dark places that people end up in. I don't know if you've read Robin Wall Kimmerer Braiding's book, Sweetgrass, but I strongly recommend it. She says, if all the world is a commodity, how poor we grow. When all the world is a gift in motion, how wealthy we become. Building bridges is to pass on the gift. I don't have time for all these things. I just want to stop there and thank you for being here today. I hope we learn each day to be better with our own inner conflicts, conflicts with each other, and that we learn to build better communities. May there be freedom, peace, safety, and sanctuary for each of you. Thank you for listening. I hope we have maybe a few minutes for a couple of questions. Amy, thank you so much so powerful you can see what see already feedback in the chat just simply brilliant beautiful rich presentation oh lovely well let's... i immediately see something there about how easy it is to blame the other and i love that remark i've said nothing about it but by jove that is one of the keys, isn't it, to catch ourselves when we name and blame and shame each other. Pause, ponder, don't do it to yourself. We're better than that. Thank you for that feedback. Thank you, Amy. I think it was so powerful, your, your description of the Northern Ireland peace process and... I was just really, I think we all were just really touched by your personal experience and then thinking about how that could make a difference. Isn't it amazing that people don't know what happened behind the scenes? Yeah. It's yeah. all just about, you know, people making an agreement. It's not like that. To make something that holds, you have to go deep and yeah. you have to listen yeah. and you have to really want to see what we mean by respecting each other and working together truly working together equally yeah that's hard earned that really is isn't it like that's not fast as you were saying in the presentation there's not kind of because there can be a lot of adrenaline when stuff's happening but it's the years of listening and going deep yes with each other yeah yes and we get stronger don't we john yeah. as we do this job i mean you're doing it at the to the nth degree you know listening to all these groups talking with each other and you're listening and you know what they're talking about and you see that very process 
that we're looking at today happening in front of your eyes. This is what we are all engaged with pro professionally. Don't yes. underestimate what you're doing, guys. Well, and that's so important what you're saying, like to find ways to bring it out of uh, the privacy of uh, the consulting room, which is so important with our one-to-one -one clients, but really opening, yeah. opening that into the world. And Sylvia, I can see you've got your Zoom hand up. Can we take a moment for a comment, Emmy? How are you doing? Yeah, for time? sure. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a few minutes. Yes. Sure. Sylvia, lovely to see you. Hi. Um, thank you so much. I have to hold on to my apple. I'm so Yay. Sorry. I'm so emotional right now. Thank you so much, Emmy. I had the privilege of introducing you at the Therapy for Social Change Network. You might remember that. And yes, I do. I'm excited because I actually started at your college this week. I'm doing masters in existential psychotherapy. So this is such a lovely cool introduction, present to myself. But yeah. my question is, I'm coming in, and, and it's somewhat to do with my studies as well. I'm coming into the therapeutic world from the world of social media marketing, digital media. I was in the mm. first wave of bloggers. And when social media started, it started by scientists in the spirit of exactly what you're saying, collaborating, reconnecting, dialoguing, the blogging with the comments section. And, and of course, like everything else, the moment it was, it was taken over by monetizing a uh, few people in power and reflecting the way the world is offline it has yeah. started showing us the image of humanity and it's yeah. not easy it's complex we refer to social media and digital technologies in a negative sentiment tend to displace our worries there that's the problem where in actual fact at least in my personal experience it's more complicated than that. Oh, yes. I work, I work as a virtual reality therapist. We're helping people with complex PTSD as possible in eight sessions. I think it's magical. So I guess my question is, you are so familiar with the world of existentialism. Where do you see the options for reconnecting for people, for groups, for individuals and for therapists in the realm of digital technology and, and how is oh, that? Thank seen? you. That's a wonderful question. I can't actually be too much longer because I got to go to a recording session in the studio in, in 10 minutes. Um, I'm doing a lot of social media and I run like Facebook groups where, you know, in some of the groups, a lot of conflict has happened. And I've had to learn to mediate in the Facebook group exactly in the same way in which I have mediated um, online training groups or actual face-to-face -face groups. But what I've also seen happening, say on Twitter, for instance, which, which I've been very active in, and I have something like 50,000 Twitter followers, is that you get people persecuting you, showing this actual evil intent and making threats to you and stuff like that. And I have had to learn that sometimes when people are not there in order to have a conversation, you simply have to block and unfollow and give up on that relationship. So that is something I have really learned how difficult that can be and how important it is. And now most of my social media effort, I would say is on YouTube because YouTube, I find a much more congenial medium where I can put out something where I say something and then the people who listen to that and who come back in the comments are people who are already interested in that topic, more like what we do here today. And then you can have a much more fluid and interesting conversation. But even there, there will be the people who come and attack. And I have found it a very good expansion of my resilience to challenge myself 
to understand where they are coming from rather than as I would do on Twitter, block them and to actually try to get to the root of it. So that is a forum that for me has a future um, possibility for bringing many people around the world together. And I came to realize that YouTube has 3 billion people on it, which is a third of the world population. So the thought of actually having a medium there where you can have this global conversation about really important things is, is very invigorating to me, very challenging. And I often lie awake thinking, how do I deal with this particular situation? And it takes a lot sometimes to put yourself into somebody's shoes when they're mean with you. But it is such an important thing to do it and to allow it into yourself and to overcome it. So I think the future of humanity is online in the virtual world and will be mediated by social media. I strongly believe that. Thank you, Amy, and thank you, Sylvia. Really appreciate that question. Yeah, very good thank question. You so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for keeping yes. it hopeful. <laughs> Let's fight for the hope. <laughs> yes, absolutely. There's so much opening up in front of us all, hasn't there? Amy, I just want to say thank you so much for these two hours together. There's so much more to say, isn't there? It's like, and yeah. Um, Feels we're like really we're only looking, starting, John, isn't it? We're only getting going and we're yeah. hoping to do more and more together as we collaborate and build we these will. resources for the existential movement. We're, the next time you're back with us here at online events is our collaboration with the Existential Academy, the Friend of Four Conference. Yeah. So definitely encourage colleagues to come back um, and be part of that. Thank you, Jeff, for the link. And I'm sure there's going to be more opportunities. Yes. Too, and so. in my talk for that, I will, you know, take some of what I haven't said today and build on that and maybe, you know, go over a few of those things, but build on that. Yes. Oh, fantastic. So if anybody was thinking, oh, what about those bits we didn't get to come back for the conference? Um, it'd be great to be together for that. Oh, I see Jeff has put it there. Yes. So that's great. And I'll email everybody out the link as well. Cool. So thank I hope you, to everybody. see a lot of you there. That and would be thank great. Thank you for being here today. I got to run. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. We really appreciate your presence. Thank you, Jeff, for the technology. And Amy, thank you for a wonderful two hours. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.